India just overtook China as the most populous country in the world. India is projected to overtake China as the world's most populous country. As the world's most populous nation. The most populous country. The most populous country. The world's most populous country. The most populous nation. 1.4 billion people and growing. India's population has always been a cause of concern. In the seven decades since partition, the country's population grew from about 35 crore in 1950 to more than 140 crore by 2021. परिवार नियोजन का पहले इसका नारा था दो या तीन बस अब दो पे ही बस कर दिया है There is no doubt that if our population continues to grow at the present rate we are going to have very severe problems by the end of the century But this legitimate question of the consequences of a growing population has long been weaponized to whip up communal hatred which looks something like this now India is exploding, exploding. This is a population bomb. Muslim abadi jo hai, thodi bade zada bade, lekin badhti chali. Border par Muslim abadi itni tezi se badi hai, jise jansankhya jihad. Ek var ki wo kaun si abadi hai, jiske karan sabse zada chinta is vak pada ho gayi hai. This is the Hindu right wing's narrative of the demographic dread. It is a constantly stoked fear that Muslims will one day outnumber Hindus and take over the country. With the Hindutva government in power, this paranoia has increasingly become mainstream in politics and the society more broadly. By making the population problem a Muslim problem, this propaganda completely eclipses the real issue of population growth in a poor country like India. And because it plays to deep-seated prejudice against Muslims, it is widely prevalent. So before we look at what the real problem is, let's first address some of the claims made about Muslim population growth in India. Do these claims stand the scrutiny of facts and figures? This video is a collaboration between Hate Busters and Nows, a website committed to debunking anti-Muslim hate speech and promoting positive, accurate news about Muslims and Islam. Its ultimate aim is to foster a just and inclusive society where diverse communities coexist peacefully. To achieve this, the website offers a comprehensive toolbox including a debunking hate section with well-researched articles backed by references, an eye-opener section highlighting uplifting stories that dispel misinformation, a library for accessing books, and a media section for finding videos, all rigorously verified and sourced. Visit hatebusters.in and join in the fight against hateful propaganda and Islamophobia and help in creating a more inclusive and understanding world. With that in mind, let's now get back to the video. Some of the most popular claims made about Muslim population growth are Muslims have too many children Muslims have more than one wife, that is they practice polygamy Muslims do not use family planning methods and of course they do all of this so that they can one day outnumber the Hindus. Claim number one. Muslim dharm mein jo hai, wo ab jaante hain ki 50 aurat rakhiye aur 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 jo hai 1050 bacha paida kiye. Ye koi parampara nahi. Ye to ye to jo hai ek ek jo hai janwari pravriti hai. Government data tells us that this is factually incorrect. The National Family and Health Survey shows that the total fertility rate or TFR of Muslims has been steadily declining over the years and has almost reached replacement levels. This is actually the case for all religious groups in India. And even though the current fertility rate of Muslims is higher than that of Hindus, the difference is only slight and this gap has been rapidly narrowing. In the past 15 years, the difference has reduced to 0.42 births per woman from 0.81 births, a trend that indicates that the convergence between the two communities is on its way. 
But why is the TFR of Muslims even slightly higher than that of Hindus? Is it because they are Muslim? Diving deeper into the data tells us that fertility rates have more to do with socio-economic conditions than religious beliefs. In urban India, for example, where people have better access to education, healthcare and other resources, the overall fertility rate is substantially lower than that in rural India. Similarly, with the increase in the level of schooling and wealth, the overall fertility rate declines. Therefore, unsurprisingly, in the two Muslim-majority union territories in India, the islands of Lakshadweep and Jammu and Kashmir, the fertility rate is much lower than the national average and significantly below replacement levels. A 2021 Pew Research shows that a woman's level of education is the best indicator of the number of children she will have in her lifetime. Which means, lower TFRs are linked to higher levels of education and access to healthcare, and not to whether you're Muslim or not. Claim number two. अगर जनसंख्या बढ़ती जा रही है, उसके लिए हिंदू जुम्मेदार नहीं है, जुम्मेदार वो है जो चार बीबी और चालीस बच्चों की बात करते हैं। Polygamy is often used as a trope to demonize Muslim men and the community in general. An infamous slogan during the Ram Mandir campaign by a prominent VHP leader claimed that polygamy turns Muslim women into sexual objects and breeders, and that for every five Hindu children born. Muslims have 50, and that Hindus would soon become a minority in India within 25 years. It's been 30 years, and we are yet to see her prediction materialize. But what about polygamy? Historically, looking at data, 1961, the last census to look at marriages by religion, Muslims were found to be not very polygamous. In fact, they were the least polygamous. Adivasi communities topped the list. 1974. A government survey confirms that Muslims continue to be the least polygamous. 1993. Research conducted by Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics in Pune also confirms that Muslims are not more polygamous than Hindus. 2021. The latest analysis of three rounds of NFHS data shows that in some states, Muslims are more polygamous than Hindus, while in others, the reverse is true and Hindus are more polygamous. Again, tribal communities stop the list. So Muslim men are not actually the four wives wielding barbaric monsters with 50 children. And mathematically speaking, they cannot be. Because fun fact, given the skewed sex ratio in India, though now getting better, there are more men than there are women. So the four wives that Muslim men are marrying, uh, they do not exist. Generally speaking, the practice of polygamy in India is very low and on the decline. And surveys tell us that it is in underprivileged communities with little access to formal education that you mostly encounter this practice. Claim number three. We are there for all of you to support in women education and also reducing poverty. But poverty will never be reduced unless you control your population. This claim mostly stems from the largely held belief that Muslims are theologically restricted from practicing contraception. If we historically look at Muslim reform in India, even though contraception doesn't find mainstream endorsement, it is not dismissed either. Not only did it have its fair share of advocates in India's early history and medical credibility in texts like the curricula of Yunani Atib, even scholars who disapproved of it conditionally made space for it. It is sterilization that mostly finds a unanimous prohibition, while all other preventive measures are open to a diversity of positions. By the 1990s, you have Muslim medical practitioners like Dr. Javed Jamil, author of Islam and Family Planning, that actively collaborate with the government and lead family planning programs focusing on the needs of the Muslim community. And these efforts reflect in data. A simple comparative analysis of the first NFHS data with the latest one shows that the use of different methods of family planning among Muslims rapidly rose from 27.7% in 1993 to 60.2% by 2020. That's a pace much higher than that of the Hindu community. Again, it is important to remember that even here, socio-economic indicators play a key role. Contraception use increases with increase in wealth and TFR rates decrease with the increase in levels of education. Claim number four. In 1930, the Yojana Baddha Riti and the Muslims of 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 the 
अपना प्रभुत्व अपना वर्चस्व स्थापित करेंगे और फिर इस देश को पाकिस्तान बनाएंगे फाइनली वॉट एवरी थिंग बॉयल्स डाउन टू द डेमोग्राफिक ट्रेड विल मुस्लिम आउट नंबर हिंदूज लाइकली नेवर येस Muslims have seen a slight increase in their total population share from the 1951 census to the 2011 census while Hindus have recorded a slight decline but the Muslim fertility rate like we saw earlier has seen a dramatic decline it is decreasing at a rate much higher than that of Hindus and so that gap is rapidly converging and as a whole India's religious composition has been largely stable since partition former chairperson of the national committee to review the family welfare program actually predicts that by the next census hindu population will show a slight increase while muslim population will either stabilize or go down religion is only one part of a very complicated puzzle that determines fertility rates there are other more significant factors that play a role education life expectancy access to healthcare average levels of wealth jobs social cultural norms etc SY Qureshi former chief election commissioner and author of the book The Population Myth Islam Family Planning and Politics in India says that the real factors are not religion the real factors are not islam the real factors are namely three particularly education especially of girls second income third service delivery as the literacy goes up number of children goes down as the income goes up number of children goes down and so all these claims are essentially false and yet they are popular it is a result of sustained propaganda conspiracy theories like love jihad and forced conversions also fuel this anxiety around numbers and it is this toxic concoction of the demographic dread which then enables polarization and the othering of the muslim community Anxiety around numbers can be traced back to the colonial period in India. Once the British started enumerating the people of the subcontinent into categories for administrative purposes, religious communities emerged in numbers. And these numerical figures were used by both Hindu and Muslim leaders for political purposes. It was census data that UN Mukherjee used in 1909 when he predicted the disappearance of Hindus from the subcontinent. The core theorization of the population problem also came from the British. It was Thomas Malthus in 1798 that proposed the idea that the larger the world population, the more the strain on resources and consequently harder the lives of people. He was proved wrong in the centuries that followed as both human population and living standards increased alongside each other. But the Malthusian idea has remained. The logic has an appeal to it. Resources are limited, so lesser the people better the lives climate change activism uses it but so does the anti immigration narrative in the west and hindutva here at home so the question becomes when we speak of lesser people which people are we talking about globally speaking the problem of overpopulation is associated with underdeveloped countries in asia and africa or here in india the hindutva establishment makes it a muslim problem Deciding which people should be less is what the whole theory of eugenics is about. The idea aimed at the racial improvement of the human race and better protection of the earth's resources, which the Nazis used to justify the Holocaust. So overpopulation narratives are often inherently biased against vulnerable groups and minority communities. An American biologist wrote a best-selling book in 1968 called The Population Bomb. Dramatic prediction Sometime in the next 15 years the end will come and by the end I mean an utter breakdown of the capacity of the planet to support humanity. While the catastrophic predictions that the book made like worldwide famines eventually proved inaccurate, it particularly spoke about the need for population control in underdeveloped countries. In fact, the sterilization program under Sanjay Gandhi in India that resulted in gross human rights abuses was led by a white American foundation. by a mass sterilization infrastructure created by the Ford Foundation's Douglas Ensminger. So when we talk about the limited resources so few people logic, we must also interrogate the which people question. Are all people equally consuming these resources? If not, why are these resources unequally distributed? Why do some people have a monopoly over resources while others are victims of scarcity? Which countries have the biggest carbon footprint? 
what corporations are the largest producers of emissions. Coming back to India, how do we understand and deal with its population growth beyond propaganda and the biases of overpopulation narratives? Statistically speaking, things are not so bad. Even though we are now the most populous country in the world, all religious communities in India have seen their fertility fall. And since growth rates have declined for all communities, India's population expansion has actually slowed down since the 1990s. Demographic transition theory suggests that populations of communities go through three different phases. First, of high birth and high death rates. Second, of high birth and low death rates. And lastly, of low birth and low death rate. The Indian population is now approaching the third stage and moving towards stabilization. Studies coming out of the United Nations and the Seattle-based Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation project India's population peaking by the middle of this century and stabilizing. The cause of this growth, despite decreasing TFRs, is what is called population momentum. That is, an increase in population because of a young population that is in its reproductive stage. And this young population can actually be of advantage for us. Because economically speaking, it's a very beneficial demographic dividend if employed and scaled strategically. So yes, being the most populous country means a lot of stress on our resources. But it is population management that we need, not population control. The Indian government has consistently promoted family planning since the 1950s, ranging from contraceptives and infamous instances of forced sterilization to many proposed bills over the years. Even birth control programs can fail without structural changes in society as a whole, as argued by Mamdani's 1973 study of population control in an Indian village. So coercive legislative measures are not the answer. The latest of bills was the Population Control Bill 2019, which was eventually withdrawn, and the UB Population Bill 2021. It primarily promotes a two-child norm, draws inspiration from China's one-child policy, and was accompanied by blatant anti-Muslim rhetoric. Muslim population in Assam needs population control measures. Is one child policy the way forward? Experts say no. Coercive and punitive methods can lead to gender imbalance, adversely affect women's reproductive rights, violate constitutional rights to public employment, and marginalize the already marginalized. Then there is a the problem of aging. Aging population is now a global demographic trend. China itself has overturned its single child policy owing to a demographic crisis and has moved on to a three child policy instead. India isn't completely immune to this trend either. There are states in India that have TFR lower than that of Japan, which has been called a crisis that no one is talking about. Instead of aggressive family planning, these states need to focus on aging instead. And of course, the big question of linking population control to limited resources needs to be redirected to the conversation of unequal distribution and inequality. What is important is the redistribution of resources. We know the concentration of wealth that we are actually experiencing at the moment, you know, the small quantum uh, being shared by the larger population, which is at the lower wealth quintiles versus larger share of power, wealth with the population which is at the higher wealth quintile. What we need is continued awareness programs, better implementation of and access to family planning, special attention to states with TFRs higher than the national average and more efficient healthcare systems, not communal propaganda.